and Cultural Expression Society is called the Beginner's Carving Program. What is the age range of your participants? Who is your target audience? Our target audience are high-risk youth up to age 30. The, a the age range of our participants, uh, we've opened it up recently. So it goes from anywhere from... What do we say? Cradle to grave. Yes. Everybody who's interested. What is the aim of your program? The aim of our program is to connect or, or reconnect youth to traditional ways of uh, knowledge, making art, to, um, connecting, hopefully in the future, connecting to the land and language and elders and really just connecting youth and to something that they feel that they can be a part of and so that when they leave this place they can, you know, be productive people in the communities. And it's also a wellness program. Mm -hmm. So they can come and uh, hopefully be substance free, uh, have a safe place to hang out, mm -hmm. learn. And, and really the aims sometimes change. You know, the objectives and the aims sometimes change dependent on who walks through those doors and what they need. What are your learning objectives? Our learning objectives. Wellness is probably, for me anyway, is the top objective, finding balance in your life. And we achieve that through art, and through connecting to elders. Now we have elders here, which is awesome, but through art and culture and just, you know, traditional knowledge. So um, wellness is our objective, and those are our means to get there. Uh, would you say this program is an example of excellence in Indigenous education? Uh, that's a really, that's a loaded question. <laughs> yes, I do. I think, um, because when, when it's working and when we have individuals in here that are connecting with what we're doing, it is all, it is kind of a traditional way to learn. You learn by doing, you learn by uh, having a mentor and you watch and you learn and you progress. It's, you see the changes in, in kids who come in here and do connect uh, and it's transformational, as opposed to when we go into schools and we watch the students in schools, in public schools, where they're lost. So, I mean, if, I don't know, maybe not in terms of indigenous education is excellent, but in terms of what's out there, it's excellent, you know. And we're always striving to do better, but I think we do pretty good. How would you measure the success of your program? Do you notice a change in the participants? Is there an evaluation form? Is there feedback? There's constant feedback. And yes, that's how we measure success is on an individual basis on where each of these guys have started and where they are going. Sometimes it's as simple as how many wood chips that they've made each day and really in, in terms of how they've changed as humans, right? Can I give an example? Mm -hmm. mm. <clears throat> For example, is Stuart. I always use Stuart as an example because he was a part of the program in elementary school, high school, and then he started uh, working here, coming to the, pro the beginner's program. Uh, then he went away to school, he started working here, now he's teaching elementary school kids how to do the art forms. Mm -hmm. um, from your perspective, what is Indigenous education? How would you define the word Indigenous? That's another loaded question. <laughs> oh, indigenous education. Well, to me, <clears throat> I think Indigenous is like uh, a lot of cross cultures. I don't find Indigenous should be used uh, to take away the word First Nation, um, which our organization is a lot of cross cultures uh, working together. But that's how I see the word Indigenous. I don't usually use that word. So this is, is this a word you would normally use? No. How would you define education from an Indigenous perspective? I think Indigenous, uh, education from the Indigenous perspective, it's, it's like land-based or place-based. Like, so whatever is, wherever you are, 
You need to know about your surroundings and your relations and interactions with them, right? So often that other form of education where you're learning about, I don't know, the physics of, you know, the space shuttle, there, there's not a, there's no context, so it's context-based, right? Hands-on, you know, doing something to learn it. Uh, that, in, in my mind, right? It's, it's finding that balance and that harmony with the, your surroundings. And so, um, and then that's what I think an Indigenous education is. And I think that's, it's not just here in Canada, but that's a, a universal thing. All the Indigenous populations all over the world, mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's learning your connections uh, you know, around, with your surroundings. Um, but we don't usually use that term. It's just kind of what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like our organization, too, um, you don't leave here with a certificate of completing anything or get a degree or master's in anything, but you leave here with so many skills that you could use throughout your whole lifetime uh, to sell your artwork or to teach people or inspire people or uh, those are other forms of educate education for them. Or even just finding balance in your life so that you can do whatever it is that you want to do. Mm hmm you know, um, we have people who've come through here who started and they design and they draw and they carve, and, but they don't end up doing that later on in their life, but they've stabilized in their lives so that they can hold down a desk job or they're a carpenter or some of them have gone to, you know, um, art school or, or whatever, but, um, yeah, balance. What is your vision for the future of Indigenous education in your community? For me, it's to take over the education system. Because if, because I believe it's universal, that you know, all cultures, you know, all kids, if you watch kids, they all learn this way. They learn by doing, right? And I think if we connect our kids to our communities and to our environments that surround us, They'll have more. It's, they'll have. They'll be. They'll be more buy-in. So they'll want to protect it. They'll want to save it. And if you don't have that, and there's no connection, that's when it's easy to just destroy the environment. And like, oh, I don't care about that forest. I just care about my phone. You know. Um, but in our community, that it really takes hold, and there's more. Yeah, there's more opportunities for kids to learn hands-on, learn traditional ways of being on this land, because that's how it was done for thousands of years without any kind of tipping point where we've taken too much or we've destroyed it or whatever. We need to find a way to get back to that. And I think if we learn um, those ways then and respect them, then we'll go back to them, in my mind anyway. In Canada, I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> Baby steps. Baby steps. What is your vision for the future of Indigenous education in Canada? Mm. You know how I see <clears throat> it happening in it, how it would be ideal, I think, about my community, like a small community? I think yeah. about how hard it is for young people to... Um, well, anybody actually like to stay in, engaged and interested in schools when you're on a structured, this is what you have to learn, this is how you have to learn it, this is um, what you need to graduate, even though you're not going to use all of those things when you're done school. Um, I think that it would be amazing if all the First Nations had their own schools where you could teach um, art like this, carving, um, have a beginner's program, uh, teach them the just the basics that they need for the career that they decide to go into. So if they need to go into carpentry, um, be flexible. Just let them graduate with their math and science that they require, or English or whatever, grade 10. Um, get them started in their apprenticeship. Uh, be flexible with hours. Let's be real youth don't get up at 8.30 in the morning to go to school and function properly, right? So I see, that's how I see things working within the smaller communities or even in smaller areas like Whitehorse. Mm -hmm. uh, in the bigger cities in Canada. It's a whole other challenge. It man. is. Like it's, I, I laugh at the big city. 
to come here. Like I grew up in Vancouver. Um, and it, I don't know. It's because those those like those types of education and that way of seeing the world are so polar opposite. And, and often kids are. I've heard it said before. The kids, you know, oh, you need to walk in both worlds, right? But how do you do that if you live in the city all the time? You can't. Right. So maybe then the city needs to come to this world. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. That's a hard um, one. But I think in indigenous education, and I think what's often forgotten, and you see it in the schools, there's a huge disconnect. I mean, all these kids who are in the schools, if they wanted to, they could do fine in these schools if they wanted to. Something, they reject it, right? And that's actually pretty cool that they reject it because it's not natural but there's a lot of healing that needs to happen before even basic learning can happen and so I think that needs to be recognized and acknowledged and really these kids need to feel safe they need to be healthy be heard and heard and when you have that then let's worry about how we're going to do it because until you have that you all you're doing is putting out fires because these kids are coming to school, they're hungry, or, or whatever, they're hungry, they've witnessed something terrible, and they just shut down. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do in that school. Even if you have the greatest programming, they ain't going to do it because they're hurting. So maybe educating the educators. Yeah, yeah that's probably a big deal. To, to create that, you know, some, some understanding, and maybe even some compassion, because you see that, a lack of compassion in schools. Why can't you do this? You should do this. No, you just witnessed your mom get beat up last night. You know, this math problem really doesn't have any significance to me right now. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of healing before you actually move forward, I think. Um, can you think of any types of information, material, resources you need to achieve that vision aside from funding? <laughs> I like that, aside from funding. We need our own piece of land to yes. achieve that. Yeah. Donated yeah. to us Space. with a beautiful building mm-hmm. that's functional where we can make all of our dreams come true. I'd like um, to build that building, actually. Why That'd not? Awesome. We could hire students to mm-hmm. come and work. And, uh, yeah, it's a dream. Mm-hmm. Uh, information. You know how many times we've moved since 2004? How many times have we moved, Colin? I lost track. At least five times, yeah. you know? And that's a lot of times to pack up and pick up and relocate and change everything. The name's been changed twice. Um, and you know, it takes what? How long have we been in here? A year and a half? Yeah. It takes at least a year before you feel comfortable in mm-hmm. a new place. So... You know, you, you, that's that whole two steps forward, one step back, right? In fact, sometimes it's one step forward and five steps back. <laughs> so, you know, like the amount of youth that we would love to have here, the amount of programming we want to offer, the amount of vision that we have to expand this place to live up to the name that we have is really difficult in a small space like this. We're going to be doing, um, we have sewing machines, we have industrial sewing machines. We're getting a silkscreen machine. And there's like, and where, where are we going to put it? Mm-hmm. Um, I would love for, I know you said aside from funding. Mm-hmm. So like, I think, you know, it'd be great if a group of First Nations or government or educators or anything would come together and really see like the, the purpose behind this place and how much how many artists have actually come out of here how many youth that we've that have said we saved them uh listen to all our success stories and helped us to find a place that we could call home for a long time longer than three years right and affordable You know, even knowing other people, you know, just, you say, in terms of types of information, who else in the country is doing this kind of work? If we could connect with them, you know, maybe you could share, you know, uh, visions and share resources um, and connect with them, right? 
because I really do think the model that we have here would work in other communities. You know, maybe not with carving, but just the model.